time following coverage of the Olympics. between you and me there has been for 10 years i'd really love to bury the hatchet right in your head i want us to sleep together is this how you ask men out i never ask men out i'm very flattered but i don't like you mm. yes you do and at this point the best thing we can do is pray chicago hope continues friday at 10 on bbc one Ted Hoffman's private life hits the headlines. Murder one in a moment on BBC Two. Right, the governor. She's got over 500 inmates. They knew that he would explode again. Get me back up north to see my family. A tide of unrest. We had information there was going to be an escape attempt this week. And no easy answers. I'm not prepared to compromise the security of this jail to get visitors through quickly. I'm always trying to get the balance right between security and care. It's not fiction, but real life drama. Law women in half an hour. Before that, on BBC One, the nine o'clock news with Michael Burke. The Princess of Wales has resigned from a hundred charities because she says her status has changed with her divorce. They say it'll cost them hundreds of thousands of pounds. After ten days of trouble in Northern Ireland, the recriminations as the politicians try to rebuild the peace process and how the human body could be used in the computers of the future. Good evening. The Princess of Wales has resigned as president or patron of nearly a hundred charities. She said that following her divorce and consequent loss of status, she didn't believe she could give them the commitment they deserved. The Princess will now concentrate on just six charities. This is another dramatic move by the Princess, graphically underlining her feelings about her new status as a result of the divorce she didn't want. But it isn't a knee-jerk response. She's been considering her move for some time. She takes the view that the charities she's worked for should be free to seek another royal patron because she is now technically no longer a member of the royal family. Her announcement came without warning, leaving the charities deprived of their figurehead and money spinner. One in Wales is planning to ask her to think again. A gala concert last year was just one event she supported to help it raise money for a children's hospice. Her being uh, our patron has made a tremendous amount of difference. Our level of income rose dramatically within the first few months uh, that she was our patron and has continued ever since. How do you think it will affect your fundraising now? It, it will affect our fundraising, there's no doubt about that. In her letter to the charities, the princess says, although I'm embarking upon the future with hope, I also do so with some trepidation, since there are a number of matters which I shall need to resolve. As I seek to reorganize my life, it will not be possible for me to provide you with the level of commitment that I believe you deserve. Her words reflect the uncertainty she now feels about her future. Without the title Her Royal Highness, which mattered so much to her, divorced from the prince and yet still the mother of the future king. In the past two and a half years, since she announced that she was cutting back on her public duties, the princess has concentrated on just a handful of charities. She took on a new role with the Red Cross, but in the end made few appearances for them. Even so, her decision to sever her ties with so many has caused shock and disappointment. And one royal commentator feels she's acted impetuously. It certainly seems that she's fairly disestablished and confused at the moment and perhaps licking her wounds and it does seem uh, at the outset to be a fit of pique. It seems that, that is the way she has taken her revenge on people. If so, that's rather a pity. She will, however, continue to work for six charities that she's been most closely involved with, including Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children. According to her spokeswoman, she'll be making some high-profile trips abroad to raise funds for them, as well as supporting them behind the scenes, a prospect that pleases the hospital. Everybody who comes into contact with her when she comes here is lifted by that experience. She gives a real warmth to her contact with people here. She makes them feel that she's interested, and I'm sure she genuinely is. She has a real love for the children, and she comforts the parents wonderfully. 
She remains dedicated to the fight against AIDS. Only recently she visited a clinic in London and will continue her work with the National AIDS Trust. The other charities she'll keep on are Centrepoint for the Homeless, the English National Ballet, the Leprosy Mission and the Royal Marsden Hospital. Although the princess has been thinking about this for some weeks, the timing of her announcement, one day after her decree Nysai was granted, will send a potent message to Buckingham Palace. And that is that however much they insist that she will still be regarded as a member of the royal family, if they take away her HRH and reduce her rank, she sees little reason to continue with her public role as if nothing had changed. Jenny Bond, BBC News at Kensington Palace. Northern Ireland's politicians came face to face again today for the first session of the multi-party talk since the Drum Cree March. Unionist leaders came under attack from the SDLP and Alliance Party, who condemned them for doing nothing to avert the violence which followed. Tonight, the chairman of the talk, Senator George Mitchell, said that despite the extreme difficulties of the past week, the talks were the only way forward. Northern Ireland may be quieter than it has been, but the consequences of last week's violence go on. Today, RUC divers were involved in searches for clues that might help them track down whoever carried out last week's murder of a Catholic taxi driver. At the Stormont talks, there were recriminations about the behaviour of unionists during the confrontation with Orangemen last week. Both the nationalists and middle-of-the-road politicians wanted the talks chairman, George Mitchell, to investigate whether his principles on peaceful politics had been broken. Anyone who looks at the television pictures of the last week can only have seen force and the threat of the use of force and can only have seen the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party leading the charge. But tonight, after a meeting with former Senator Mitchell, David Trimble appeared unrepentant. And we pointed out to the chairman that there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever uh, for the claims made by Mr Alderdice. There is no statement that I or any other unionist made in the course of the last week that could be regarded as incitement or approval of violence. And there's no shortage of statements made by myself and other members of the uh, Ulster Unionist Party condemning violence when it occurred, uh, when it was committed by fringe elements. British and Irish ministers had what was described as a constructive 20-minute discussion, a step forward after their very public and very angry exchanges last week. Despite the differences between the politicians, the ministers are clearly keen to press ahead with the talks. There has been some momentum today. A series of talks have taken place with, I believe, a new urgency based on the horror of what we saw for the last 10 days. And now there's an urgency on all politicians, all parties and the governments to make sure we get to that table in meaningful dialogue as quickly as possible. There is